So um, I'm, I'm very ha happy to hear about the uh, gap theory because I'm an improviser and um, so I've been incubating on what I'm going to say. And I guess now's the time to um, close the gap. So here I go. I, I know that it's good to start a talk with some kind of compelling story. So could I have a suggestion, a one-word title for a, a compelling story that I could start my talk with? A what? A brick worker. Oh, this is a great one. Um, I, I may forget bits and pieces of it. So if I, if I look like I, I need someone to fill in the gap, would you just quickly close it for me so that we're not uncomfortable? All right? Okay, so this is a, it's a great story about a, a brick worker who, um, he, was a, he was a pig, actually. Um, he and his brothers had um, tried a number of materials to build their houses. And um, the first couple materials that they started with didn't, didn't work very well. So, so finally they ended up with bricks, and they bought a house, and it was safe, and it kept out the wolves. And, um, and so they decided to start a business. And the first thing they did to start their business was um, they, they sold mortar. So, so first they figured out you know, going into a whole brick business is, is too much. We'll, we'll sell the stuff for the in between the bricks, and then we'll uh, create a need. And once people have the mortar, then they're going to want the bricks. So they opened a little shop, and they started to sell the mortar. And, and the first person who came into their store was was a rabbi. <laughs> and the rabbi looked around the mortar. He said, oh, I see you have mortar, but no bricks. Ah, well, you know what the Talmud tells us about mortar without bricks. It is the best possible thing. Because if you have the bricks, you have the answers. If you have the mortar, you have the questions. And it is the questions which will allow you to build anything you want. And that's the story of the brick zone. Um, <laughs> uh, he and his brothers actually decided to not only sell bricks, but anything else that you could stick together with mortar. And, um, and they've <laughs> been very successful in one of these big box shops that's about to die at some point. <laughs> OK, so, so that's improv, right? And, and, and these days, sort of wherever you are in the world, someone's performing improv on a stage somewhere. Everybody's seen an improv show, or Whose Line Is It Anyone on television was sort of the big success story for the world of improv. And, um, and it's entertaining, and people enjoy it. They enjoy doing it, and they enjoy watching it. The idea that you could take the principles and techniques of the improvisational theater, though, and apply them to uh, professional stages in education, or corporate America, or uh, ther therapy, um, may seem a little wacky to people still, um, you know, or at best gimmicky. Um, in fact, it has been embraced by everyone from senior steel company executives to physicians to bankers to, you know, big success stories <laughs> uh, to teachers. Because, in fact, what improvisers are doing is what all of us are doing all the time, every day, right? So what an improviser does is get up on stage with some pals and uh, make up stuff on the spot with nothing but their own ideas and whatever's going on around them in front of a demanding audience that wants to get their money's worth. And the world is more and more revealing itself, as many of us have talked about today, to be just like that. You don't have a script when you wake up in the morning. The answer for today is not going to be the same answer as yesterday. All you have is what exists and what you're going to do with it. And the good news about pulling from improv in our worlds is that improvisers have been spending a lot of time saying, OK, we're going to get up. We're going to create in the moment flexibly in an adaptive way based on whatever's coming at us with the people that we have to work with. And we have to figure out how we can get better at doing that. And what improvisers believe and what we are bringing out to the world is that these are, in fact, learnable skills, that they're muscles, if you want, 
that being more creative or connecting and collaborating with people or being more adaptive or finding a new solution or giving up habitual ways of being for newer, fresher, more effective ways of being that match the current environment are things that we can learn to do. We can practice that. And so I want to give you the secret to world peace, the one secret to world peace. No, I'm not going to do that. But I am going to give you the one fundamental core principle of the improviser that can be applied in any situation where human beings are interacting with other human beings, and often where human beings are interacting with the world or ideas. And this is it. I don't know how this works. Okay. Um, improvisers talk about the yes and rule. There are some ways in which the yes and rule is very obvious and has been accepted and implemented in corporations for a while now. Uh, one is brainstorming sessions. You say, okay, we're going to take our sensors, we're going to take our judgment voices, and we're just going to put them aside. And we're going to come up with any ideas we can. We're going to be creative. We're going to be spontaneous. And we're going to dare to come up with things that we know won't work, but uh, we'll generate them. And, and for a lot of people, that means um, we're going to wait 10 minutes before we tell someone else that their idea is stupid. Right? We'll separate the real evaluation work from the generating ideas, which we know, you know, and there are lots of ways to get around that and make it more valuable. Um, but when an improviser talks about yes and, they are not really just talking about that. Yes, we're talking about being spontaneous. Yes, we're talking about finding ways to uh, agree where you might impulsively block or say no. But really, fundamentally, we're talking about something even more core and more profound. And, and now I have to get technical for a minute. Uh, improvisers have a, a word, a technical word, and that word is offer. And an offer is, in improv parlance, anything that my partner says or does. And it is my obligation as an improviser to accept their offers, to accept and build with them. I have a million choices of how I do that, but I must be asking the question, how do I accept and build with this offer, as opposed to asking the question, Will I accept this if I'm going to accept it? So, so let's give an example. I come on stage and I say, hi, honey, I'm home. Right. Now, I've made a bunch of offers. What, what are some of the offers I've made? Now, not how are you going to respond to them, but just what are the offers that I've made? Uh, a hug. Oh, right, so my some, this is an offer, right? It could be something. What else could this offer be? It could be that I'm asking for a hug. What else could it be? <laughs> Make me a drink. Good. What else could it be? I'm carrying a barrel in of something. I brought the keg of beer home. Great, right? Maybe I have twins in my arms or groceries. But this, but this is an offer. Good. What other offers have I made? A physical treat. <laughs> Hi, honey, I brought home a physical treat for you. What are their offers? Oh, I, I have a honey, <laughs> right? I walked in, I'm relating to someone. So one of the offers I've made is there's a honey here. What's another offer I've made? I'm home, right? What? From where? We don't know. There's a whole bunch of information we don't know. But the offers that we know in that moment are, I have a honey, I'm home, there's something going on with my arms, and, uh, and, and my attitude is relatively positive, right? So just like you, my partner has a virtually infinite number of possible responses to that. He could say, oh, Honey, you brought a keg of beer home. Thank you. He could say, oh, my God, what happened to your arms? They're broken. He could say, hi, honey, I'm, you know, you're king for the day, whatever it is. <laughs> but he is obligated to hear and see and receive and accept and build with those offers. So if he says to me, who are you and what are you doing on my pirate ship? <laughs> yeah, the audience will laugh. But we have killed the scene, right? Because all we have are the offers. Right? We can only build if we accept. Now, let me be clear. I don't mean agree. I don't mean like. My partner might think those are the stupidest offers anybody ever made. Honey, we're doing a scene at home with a honey. Ugh. I have a much better idea. It's a part. But he has to accept them because it's all we've got. So, so what does this have to do with real life? Well, 
really it's exactly the same. You can look at anything in your context as an offer. And if you charge yourself with the obligation to accept and build with those offers, you increase your ability to succeed and build and create in amazing ways. It, it's hard sometimes, but we do it. So I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, I was asked a number of years ago to do a motivational speech, to give a motivational speech on team building to, uh, for a large major airline company um, to their ticket counter workers. And uh, I, they asked me not to come in the morning, but to, to show up at lunchtime, and then I was going to go right after lunch. And so I, I came by right as lunch was starting, and I say, said to my client, so how's it going? Hi. And he said, oh, it was great. It was a great meeting this morning. It was a great meeting. We gave them a lot of information. Oh, and I should let you know that one of the things that we let them know was that um, within the next two years, they're all going to be laid off. We're closing all our remote ticket counters. They're not going to exist anymore. Everyone in the room has just been told they're going to be laid off. Have a good time giving your motivational speech on team building. <laughs> so, um, so that's an offer, right? <laughs> and I didn't like it very much. I, I, you know, there were a lot of things I didn't like about it, including I had plan. I had a plan. I had a great speech about the power of teamwork. I was lucky though because there were some other offers in my world that I could accept. One was there was a big sign across the back of the room that said, there is no I in team. Heard this awful phrase. Okay, so it said, there's no I in team. And another offer was that as I had been uh, driving around in my car, listening to you know, national public radio, I'd happened to hear a few days before Michael Jordan's induction speech that he gave when he was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. And he was talking about how he was having a conversation with his coach, and his coach had said to him after a game where he'd sort of hogged the ball, I think is the technical, technical term, um, he said, uh, you know, Michael, there's no I in team. To which Michael Jordan replied, yeah, but there is in win. <laughs> so I decided, all right, I got up. I looked out at this sea of people who were about to be laid off from their team, which I was going to tell them to build, and I told them the story that I just told you. It's a good story. It's a funny little joke, right? It's witty. But most people would have the reaction that you had. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Isn't that funny? These people fell out of their chairs. They couldn't stop laughing, right? It stopped things dead for four minutes. Why? Because I yes-anded the author in the room which is, it was ridiculous to talk about teamwork when people had just told you that they were going to blow up your team, right? It was ridiculous. And once we'd stopped laughing, I was actually able to say a lot of the things that I was going to say and share a lot of the tips that I was going to share about communication and collaboration and uh, human performance and all of those things and put it in the context of, you know, transferable skills or <laughs> going through a hard time together. If I had blocked that offer, if I had ignored it, if I had said, I don't like it, la, 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 where would I have gotten? Not very far. Uh, I'll give you one more example. Um, I, I will say, this is hard. Yes, anding is a muscle that needs to be exercised. And many of us get our saying no muscles much more exercised for a number of reasons. One is we've been taught that uh, saying no makes us smart, right? That we shoot holes in other people's ideas or we're afraid of groupthink or we have to sort of, we're going to be the smart one who's going to find just the right thing that won't make it work, right? It, we also say no because it's someone else's idea or if I say yes, it's going to make more work for me or I, I don't know how it's going to work and that creates that, that sort of gap and now I'm going to have to incubate and it's uncomfortable and I want a solution. So we don't want to say yes, right? We say yes, we say no, because we're afraid. Um, but I, as a trained improviser, raising my child, decided that I was going to say yes and a no. So she came to me once at the age of four, and she said, oh. um, she's, uh, her grandmother had just bought her a pristine white pottery barn dresser for her new room when we moved. She said, Mom, she woke up in the morning, glint in her eyes, she said, Mom, I want to paint my dresser. And I said, Okay, let's, you know, get out paints. My husband's an artist. We'll sketch out a design, maybe a rainbow or some flowers. It'll be pretty. She said, no, 
I just want to paint. And I thought a couple of things. One is I thought, it's a beautiful new pristine expensive pottery barn dresser that grandma bought you and grandma's coming to visit in a couple weeks. <laughs> How is she going to like that? Right? I had a list of no's. There were so many no's in my mind, but I had to say yes. So I said, okay. And I sat on her bed while she and some of our friends painted her dresser with my fist and my heart stuffed into my mouth going, oh no, what have I done? She's going to hate it. My mother's going to hate me. I'm going to have to spend a thousand dollars to switch them out and replace them before grandma. I, right, all these reasons. And, uh, and then she finished. <laughs> and uh, she stood back and I said, so Leah, extricating my fist from my mouth. So, Leah, what do you think? And she said, Mom, you made my dream come true. And I thought, okay, that's worth it. <laughs> that's worth the risk. So, uh, you know, it's hard on stage two. It's hard as improvisers when you get up in front of people to say, we're going to commit to putting on a show where we don't know what's going to happen. And we're not going to plan our jokes in the wings ahead of time. And we're not just going to do the same story we did last time. We're going to take the risk to do it. And in order to allow us to do that, we have um, a special mantra that we repeat. And I want to share that with you and leave it with you. Because you have lots of offers today. Lots of risks that you could take. Lots of things that you could do differently. Keith Johnstone says... Uh, he's an improv guru, and he says people who say yes are rewarded by the adventures they have. People who say no are rewarded by the safety they attain. And with all of the stuff that's in the room today, I think we're going to take the risk to go for adventure rather than safety, which means we also have to be ready to accept this improv mantra of celebrating failure, because we will. So. Put your hands over your head. Say, I failed. I, failed. I, made, a I made a mistake. I feel silly. I feel silly. Good. Now give yourselves a round of applause. You now, we call that the circus bow. We borrow it from the circus, right? Because the, the trapeze artist does the amazing trick that is impossible. And then, you know, he's going to do five backwards flips. He does four and a half and falls. And then he gets up and he demands adulation because he attempted five, right? So you have now gotten permission to make a big mistake. You've already gotten the adulation. And when you do, I want you to go woohoo and celebrate failing because you tried. Thank you. Thank you.